Welcome to Artists We Love. My name is Okiba Javalo and this is Bobby ETV and today we are with Mr. Maurice Evans. What's happening, doing, sir? Thank you for taking time. And for those of you have, who um, have been living under a rock for like the last X amount of years, let's do it right here. <laughs> and I, I saw your work before even meeting you. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Where it was just like, damn, this is dope. You Thank know what I'm you. saying? But and even after meeting you, not being able to put two and two together because the way you signed your name, mm. it didn't look like Maurice Sevens. And I don't think at that point in time, I never even really looked. Mm. I kind of scanned, mm. but I didn't really, I'd be like, okay, but I was focused on the work. Mm. So then a little while after being like, oh, word. Mm. And even today, being surprised about even some more things. It's like, okay, so you got the music yeah. cracking. You learn some new stuff. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. It's a whole different game today. You know what I'm saying? It's like, <laughs> like, like, you know how it is when you know, you already know the brother's dope, but then you see some other dopeness around that dopeness, oh, and you're like, damn, I gotta get to the house and tighten my shit up. <laughs> well, it's cool when, when you can go to a, another artist's uh, place or studio mm -hmm. and get inspiration. Right. That's what I like. I, mm -hmm. I do like getting inspiration from different artists. I don't like to copy them. I just like the yeah. energy, you know right. what I'm saying? And that's. That's what I like. That's what, you know. So I know you're enjoying doing this. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Going to different, yeah. just to get a different kind of energy. It's always cool. Mm -hmm. So where are you from? Uh, I say I'm from Georgia. I wasn't born in Georgia, but I was actually born in Tennessee. Okay. My father was in the military, mm -hmm. so I was born in Smyrna, Tennessee. I'm a military brat, okay. but I've been in Griffin, Georgia, Valdosta, Georgia, and Atlanta, Georgia. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you've always been involved in the arts from childhood? Or? From the very beginning, yeah. I've always been an artist. Mm -hmm. you know? what's, what's your first memory uh, or your first piece that you put together? Uh, you mean art you're talking about? Mm -hmm. Just like, 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 let's say it like this, like um, thinking back to when I was a kid, there was, um, you know, you had Knight Rider, you had G.I. Joe, and we used to sit in class drawing little, mm -hmm. you know, things like that. And I was better than everybody at doing it. Mm -hmm. And I had a family, you know, family of, of artists, but nobody ever pursued it. Mm -hmm. So I, my first memory is that G.I. Joe drawing and be like, hey, man. Okay. Well, I'm going to tell you what, what th there was this period where I became aware of art. Mm -hmm. I, I remember that. So this is probably the first grade. Okay. Right. So I'm living in Valdosta, Georgia. My father was stationed at Moody Air Force Base, mm -hmm. right? And so I'm at school and I'm noticing these kids, they look like they're playing this game, but I don't, I don't know what it is. So I'm looking and on this paper, this sheet of paper, they were drawing out like ships. Mm -hmm. So they're like uh, aircraft carriers, right? And they had little jets and they had uh, men diving on the water right and it was like the cool like i've never seen that before you know what i'm saying and these again we had to be like five or six years old yeah. they of course the men were stick figures mm -hmm. but i was like so impressed that they could make these stick figures do whatever they wanted yeah. like literally they had them swimming they had them flying planes they had them rowing boats and that was the first time i was aware that a person could really draw you mm -hmm. know what i'm saying yeah. You know that I saw in in person, mm -hmm. and so it starts there, okay. where I'm fascinated with with art. Okay. Now, as far as music is concerned, I think mm -hmm. you got hit to the music thing yeah, today. Yeah. Um, I would say music was probably my first love. My father used to play drums, mm -hmm. right? Okay. And uh, so he played for a band, and he had a choir as mm -hmm. well. I mean, uh, he played in the choir as well. And so I would watch them rehearse. I would help pack drums, carry mm -hmm. drums, all that yeah. stuff. And so I always wanted to do the music thing. Mm -hmm. and so I was fascinated with one of the guys in his band. He was a guitar player. Mm -hmm. And when I was about five, he started giving me lessons, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I remember having this big heavy guitar. It was so big and I just couldn't figure out how to get my hands around it. And he was showing me all that stuff, mm -hmm. right? And so, but if you know about the military, people get assignments to leave all the time. Mm -hmm. So he got an assignment to leave. So 
my lessons were gone, right. Right? right? And for whatever reason, I didn't pick it up from someone else. It just, you know, I, I remember that's what I really, really wanted to do. Mm. And so, um, eventually my parents get divorced and now I'm in a different household. I'm living in Griffin, right? Mm. And so, I still wanted to learn how to play, but I didn't have anybody to teach me. Mm. I didn't have access to a guitar. My father had the guitar at this point. Mm. And so I was like, okay, so, the thing that I did have was my art. So my mother is a school teacher. Okay. You see, so back in the day, the advantage of having a mother that's a school teacher is they had access to typing paper. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You understand what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So sure. typing paper, a ink pen, or a mm-hmm. marker, that mm-hmm. was good. Right. Because, you know, a white sheet of paper to me was like gold. Yeah, you yeah, know what I'm yeah. saying? I could do something with that. Mm-hmm. And so that's what was, you know, I was, I was starting to take that on more. Right. And every time I would go to a new city, I would meet some kid that was really into the arts. Mm-hmm. And he would influence me to get back into it. Mm-hmm. You know, whether it was, you know, copying comic books or whatever, right? right. And so that's kind of where it starts for me. So I've, I've always had, you know, again, a love for music and visual art. Okay. You know, and at one point, even I, I had, at one point, I wanted to be a fashion designer. Right. At one point. Like what kind of fashion? Uh, you know, it could have been any kind of fashion. I used to watch fashion shows on 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 the weekend. Right. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And so, but but when I went to school, I went to the Art Institute mm-hmm. of Atlanta. But my mm-hmm. degree is actually fashion illustration. Oh. Uh, See right. what I'm saying? I got you. I got yeah. So, but I never did that because you know I live here mm-hmm. in Atlanta, and right. not the fashion capital. Right. And I didn't have the guts mm-hmm. to move to New York mm-hmm. without knowing anybody and not having any connections, right? Because right? all I heard was how expensive New York was, yeah. and how I would starve and be on the street. And that. It's mm-hmm. like, I don't think, think I'm gonna do that. Right. <laughs> but, uh, right. but you know, what's funny is before I graduate from the Art Institute, they, uh, uh, this guy named Patrick Kelly, mm-hmm. he's a fashion designer at the time, mm-hmm. big time. He had the show at the apparel market. And so my instructor decided to take everybody to the show. Mm-hmm. So we go to the show, and I'm the one, only one that takes a portfolio. So I took my portfolio with me, mm-hmm. right? And so after the show, and, and keep in mind, this man is big. He's huge. Like he's known for these big buttons. Mm-hmm. I mean, his his this dude is like the top of his game in the fashion industry. He's, he was like the biggest thing going at the time. And so after his show. I decided I'm gonna meet this guy. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of a big deal for me because I'm really shy. People don't know that, but I am, right? So I was like, well, I'm, a, I'm gonna meet this guy. So I waited and waited after the show. And I, I walked up to a couple people that said, well, listen, kid, he's, he's gone. He, he left already. It's like, okay, so that's, for that reason, man, I just hung around, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, right. Maybe an hour, hour and a half goes by. And all of a sudden I see these people walking from the back. And it's Patrick Kelly in the mm-hmm. center. And so I run up to him and say, hey, I'm so-and-so and so-and-so, you know, I love your work. I brought my portfolio, I was wondering if you would look at it, mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. And this guy told everybody that was with him, listen, hold on, hold on for a second. I'm gonna go check out this kid's work. Mm-hmm. And he actually took me to the side. He went through my portfolio and went through every piece, man. And I was like, wow, this dude is really taking mm-hmm. the time. You know what I'm saying? And he was like, listen, I love what you're doing. I want you to come to New York. I said, really? He said, listen, when you graduate, I'm going to hand you all my numbers, all, the, all my contacts. Mm-hmm. You come to New York after you graduate. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I'm, a, I'm high. You yeah, know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Call my mom, tell her, you know, what's going on and everything. And right before I graduated, he died. So, there went my possible career in fashion. Right. It didn't have to be, but I, after that, I didn't have any connections. Right. You know what I'm saying? So I decided to tough it out in Atlanta. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. So when was your um, aha moment when you realized that you were going to do this art come hell or high water? The fine art thing? Yeah. Um, hmm. It's hard to say. I, I, I can tell you that... Um, I used to do uh, medical illustrations mm-hmm. back in the day. It's probably like 88 or so. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was doing that for a while. I had 
kind of gotten the job through an ex classmate of mine. Mm -hmm. We both were in the fashion thing. Mm -hmm. But he started working for this company doing medical illustrations. And so I started working there. And that was cool. It's more real corporate like, you know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? And, you know, it was stressful, man. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? So I was like, uh, not really feeling so much. Mm -hmm. But then the best thing that happened to me was I get laid off. Mm -hmm. Right? And so Desert Storm is happening at the time. So it was mm -hmm. really difficult, you know, trying to make a living as an artist at the time. So I started working at hotels and I did whatever I could do to make a living. Mm -hmm. And then one day, uh, an, another artist you, you interviewed, which is Grace Kisa. Mm -hmm. Grace was working at um, this company mm -hmm. doing fine art, right. right? And so she had put the word out to a few artists, mm -hmm. you know, say, hey, you know, they're hiring at my job. So I went mm -hmm. and I interviewed with them and they said, hey, bring us some work. So I went back home, did some work, brought it back to them and they hired me. So I worked there for the next, I said about three and a half years, you know. So, you know, that was a new way of doing art. Like I never thought of art like that. They were using tools that I never thought of as art tools, you know, or, or tools to paint with. Right. And they were very creative on how they did things. So it was like going back to school, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, you know, they were using rollers instead of brushes, mm -hmm. you know. Right. And so not only did I learn new techniques and you know how to produce it on, on a consistent basis but I learned the business mm -hmm. too okay. you know so okay. just hanging around because these guys would do you know they would it, they might work on for six months on the show mm -hmm. which would be like Art Expo New York mm -hmm. and so for the next six months everybody's producing work for that show they would take that work to the show and sell to all the galleries, distributors, anybody who was buying work wholesale, right? Mm -hmm. And so once I figured it out, I was like, wow, that's, that's pretty fascinating. I didn't know that's how this works. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, okay, I, I think I get it, mm -hmm. you know? And so I started to apply that to what I was doing. Mm -hmm. So now I knew, I knew how to do it, you know, right. you know efficiently, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's where it kind of starts. And then Grace was the first person, a first artist that I personally knew mm -hmm. that sold some work yeah. at a show. Mm -hmm. Like we was, you know, we was dating mm -hmm. and she was, she would come to the apartment at my apartment because I had a table set up mm -hmm. and she would work through the night, you know, I mean, literally. And at that time, man, I, I just couldn't work through the night like that. I would fall asleep at, <laughs> you know, 10 o'clock or so. I wake up and she's still working, you know. And so she had this show she was getting ready for. And she did this show, and she sold out. And I was like, whoa, I you know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. like, I've never seen that before. I never knew that you could do that. Mm -hmm. And so she did that, and then uh, she hooked up with another gallery that was in um, at North Avenue. It was, I forget what it was called, but um, it used to be the center in North Avenue. It's over there now where Publix is, but they used to have like this gallery there, and she started showing with them. And they would call her and say, hey, we just sold a piece. And I'd be like, well, how much did they sell a piece for? It's like, oh, they sold for like 2000 2000 <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah. And so then I was like, okay, I need to, I need to try, try to do this. Right. So I would say she's the one who really inspired me to get in the game. I got you. I got you. So when looking at, because um, you could be anywhere. You are everywhere. So why make Atlanta your base? Uh... Number one reason would be uh, economics. Mm -hmm. It's probably uh, the more economically friendly place for mm -hmm. artists, I would say. Okay. Um, whether you are established or not, mm -hmm. or you know, because like if you're established, you got money, mm -hmm. then you can buy a whole lot here, right, especially right, if you're right. interested in real estate, particularly at the time. Mm -hmm. This is pre-Olympics time, right. so you could really, you know, do very well. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, so that would be, the, I would say, the main reason, you know, okay. the cost of living. Mm -hmm. And I also understood that as an artist, I'm going to travel anyway. I'm not going to be locked down mm -hmm. to a city. I would have to travel. Mm -hmm. I would have to go to New York. I would have to go to L.A. I would have to go to Chicago. So it's just a base, right. you know what right. I'm saying? And so it's not the most art-friendly place, however. Right. 
So I don't know why I stay other than uh, weather is another mm -hmm. big issue for me. Like I don't like being in places where the weather is extreme, mm -hmm. whether it's extreme cold or hurricanes. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like okay. Atlanta's kind of right in the middle. Mm -hmm. You don't get too much of anything. Well, we're going to take a break and then we're going to come right back. Okay. And this is Artists We Love. I'm here with Maurice Evans and my name is Okiba Chabala. And man, we're glad you're here. Welcome to YBE TV. So we'll be right back. Welcome to YBE TV, Artists We Love. Man, we're here with Maurice Evans, man. One of the most talented cats I know, hands down. Cats or Thank kittens. You, you know what I'm saying? Bow down to the master. <laughs> Bow down. Thank you. you know what I'm saying? But um, where do you think we need to go from here? Like the black art, the business of black arts in Atlanta. It's funny you say that. Yeah. The business of black art. Yeah, because you know you got black art, but then you got the business that other side of it. No, I understand. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, I just, it's just. Funny. I'm just clarifying for them. No, I understand. <laughs> I mean, it's just funny. You know, we have artists that don't even want to take on that title. Yeah. Black art. Right. I've never had a problem. With it. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? But we're gonna skip that. Yeah, you know. But as far as I had to, uh, well, <laughs> that's a whole nother topic. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, really, it's a really heavy topic, um, and I don't know why it's such an issue. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, and I'm proud to be. If if you want to call me a black artist, it's fine. Mm -hmm. I'm black. I'm an artist. Right. And right. I do work that pertain to my people. Mm -hmm. If that's what you want to call me, black artist, fine. Right. But I'm not limited to that. I do no, no, no. abstracts, I do mm -hmm. all kind of stuff. You yeah. know what I'm saying? What I don't like is the negative connotation that comes with it. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? But I'm not not proud to be black or an artist. Mm -hmm. You understand? But when you try to put this negative spin on it is mm -hmm. where the issue right. comes in play. So but I'm not confused about that. Yeah, I know. But uh anyway, as far as where we go from here, um, you know, like I was saying earlier, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I, I, I do feel like at this point we have to find uh, more creative ways to get our work out there and connect with the people. Because mm -hmm. people are different these days. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's not the same. It's not mm -hmm. like the, um, you know, I'm in my 40s. So, mm -hmm. I, you know, when I was younger, in my 20s, selling my work, I was selling to people in their 40s mm -hmm. and in their 60s. You know, those people had a serious appreciation for for art. Right. So now as I've gotten older, mm -hmm. right, so some of my demographics they're gone mm -hmm. or they're collected all they're gonna collect. So now I'm having to appeal to people my age and below. Mm -hmm. So how do I do that? Mm -hmm. So because again people aren't the same anymore. Right. You know, they don't have the same attention span. We can't just have a show for them and they come out. Mm -hmm. They want something else. Mm -hmm. So now I'm forced to do social media mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying yeah yeah and it's cool and not cool you know what I'm saying mm -hmm. it's cool that yes I can reach out I can put some stuff out there and anybody can see it it can be from Chicago they can be in LA they can be in New York they can be in Africa mm -hmm. they can be in China like I think that's the best thing in the world you know what I'm saying that I can literally uh, paint a painting mm -hmm. at home take a photograph of it, mm -hmm. put it up, mm -hmm. and somebody from China is like, hey, I want that. Right. That's that's the best thing in the world. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. At the same time, the disconnect, mm -hmm. the personal disconnect yeah. is what's kind of missing. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And so online, I've noticed that people want more from you online as well. They want to know they want pictures of everything you do mm -hmm. every day. Right. You know right. what I'm saying? Right. And so as an artist, you're trying to figure out that happy medium of how much I'm going to give them mm -hmm. and I want to stay private at, right. the, at the same time. Mm -hmm. Because they have to relate to you, you know what I'm saying, to, to kind of get into your work. Right. So that's what I'm trying to figure out. You know, how do you how do you do that? You know? I think it's um, one of the things I've noticed with that gap is that that generation that was 40, 60 at that time, mm -hmm. we're dealing with the 20, 30, 40 generation. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I put together is art has to become mobile. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So once it's mobile and the new collective wants people to see them collecting. Mm -hmm. So in this age of Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, people want to be 
given a trophy just for doing it, like that group. Mm -hmm. So some of the things I'm thinking about is what happens if art becomes something that's on the mobile piece. So like mm -hmm. the iPhone case, mm -hmm. handbags, um, cars, you know, certain token items that they appreciate, mm -hmm. where it can move around so they can be validated. Because that's one of the things that I don't necessarily like that, but that's one of the assessments I come away with. Like this new generation wants to be seen as mm -hmm. they well, like I mean, there's plenty of sites out there that do that, mm -hmm. you know. So, um, I don't see that as a bad thing. It's just, but we're talking about how how they want to consume it. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And right. That's how they want to consume it. They want to wear it. Mm -hmm. They want to use it more. You know, uh, a, a case for their iPad or right. a cover for their computer or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And it's I, I don't have a problem with that because mm -hmm. they're appreciating the work, right? They want that work to be a part of their lives. Mm -hmm. Who am I to tell them how they should? Should it just be on their wall? Not necessarily, you know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? If they can appreciate it on their chest, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't have a problem with that. Because the work is still the work. Right. And that's, this is the conflict that a lot of uh, artists, the self-conflict that they have. Like, you know, do I keep my work pure, what we consider pure, mm -hmm. or do I let it become a little bit more commercial? Mm -hmm. And to me, it's a silly argument. It's a, I don't understand what the problem is because at the end of the day, the work is the work. Mm -hmm. You're trying to tell me the work isn't masterful anymore because it's been put on a note card mm -hmm. or it's been put on a t-shirt. Right. That's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Is you. the Mona Lisa not valuable anymore? Mm -hmm. Because it's been made out of a calendar and coffee mug and all, all kind of stuff that you're going to find at the, at the gift mm -hmm. shop at the museum? Right. Right. You understand what yeah, I'm saying? So I'm that's a crazy argument for an artist to have with itself because the establishment is doing what they're telling you not to do. Right. You understand right. what I'm right. saying? Right. It's like it's like getting mad it's like it's like getting mad at your girlfriend because mm -hmm. she been getting she's been arguing at you about something that she does too. Right. Right. So it's like, you know, I be well, I'll be real happy when we're past that as artists. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because at the end of the day, what is the work saying? What are you trying to communicate? Is it skillfully done and masterfully done? Mm -hmm. That's that's what that's about. Right. Now, if it has an appeal to people who can't afford it, and they and they want it as a T-shirt, all it does to me is it makes that piece more popular. Right. I got you. You understand what I'm saying? I'm calling. So, you know, the thing about what we do, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, is only one. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So, if you understand value and scarcity, there's no value taken away from the, the piece. Mm -hmm. That's a perception. That's perceived. That's what the establishment has taught their people. Because they're trying to control it. Mm -hmm. They can't control it if you don't need them. Mm -hmm. You don't need them if you can make your own money off mm -hmm. your own images. Right. You know, it's no different than... You have to look at it like... I always compare visual arts to music. Right? Are you really mad at Prince because he sold three million copies of his one work? Are you serious? <laughs> Are you saying that the masters aren't valuable anymore because he sold five million copies of it? Mm -hmm. Or ten million? No, we celebrate that he sold that many. Mm -hmm. So if I decide to do a poster of one of my paintings, why are you upset? Right. Because my master painting mm -hmm. still exists. This one right here. Right. And you're going to pay for that if you want it because right. it's valuable. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think we got to get past that. That's a, some sort of, I don't know, I don't even know what the kind of mentality you call that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. It's, um, it's a couple titles floating through my head, but it's, it's yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can do different levels of work. You can do work that just say, hey, I'm, I'm going to make this really exclusive and I'm not going to do any prints of it. You can do that. You can still do that. Gotcha. You know, but back in the day, they was doing it. They did it with silk screens and wood cuts and etchings and mm -hmm. things like that. It was the same thing. That was their technology. Right. Now we have digital technology. Mm -hmm. You know, even though when I'm telling people who are collectors, I personally will like the etchings and wood cuts and silk screens because those are types of uh, art forms that directly deal with you know the quality and the amount the scarcity available because 
There's only so many of those you're going to be able to do because the, the materials will break down anyway. Right. And the each going to be a little different because you can't print the same one twice the same exact way. It's just impossible. Right. So if I'm a collector, if I'm going to advise a collector and they can't afford necessarily an original painting, I always steer them towards original prints. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and so, because it's still collectible, it's still a legitimate form of collecting. You know what I'm saying? But if that person can't afford that and they're not interested in that, they want to buy a poster? Okay. Mm -hmm. I got you. That's what it is. So, what's up next, bro? Oh, uh, what's up next? I can tell you what I'm working on now. There's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's a, a series that I'm doing right now. It's called Crowning. Okay. And Crowning is the series that I've been working on and it's dealing with uh, well actually a lot of pieces I've been doing lately is dealing with self-affirmation because mm -hmm. I've gotten to a point where I'm tired I'm really really tired of how black women in particular are being portrayed in the media right. right and how they're being taught who they are mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying which is a miseducation of who they are mm -hmm. right so the pieces I've been doing lately has been dealing with that like mm -hmm. so you know back to the crowning pieces that is particularly dealing with uh, the way women wear their hair mm -hmm. and how they adorn or display their crown right. you know what I'm saying so it's not just about you know fashion mm -hmm. you know there, there are statements being made political statements being made the way they wear their hair mm -hmm. whether it's done in a head wrap or it's done in a Afro, you know what I'm saying? Um, it's a lot being said in that. And it's a lot that goes into that, you know what I'm saying? And so, um, I've been working on a series of pieces dealing with that subject matter. Um, so yeah, you should check those out. And um, cause like there's, a, there's another piece called Affirmations. You should, you should check out if you get a chance, I'll send you a pic. Okay. But even in that, there's a lot of the Adinkra symbols mm -hmm. in the piece, they're hidden in the piece. So. It's part of the fabric of the chair that the girl is sitting in. Is some in her in her dress. Mm -hmm. There's some in the background, which is kind of like wallpaper. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And if you go back and pick out each symbol and look it up, the self affirmation. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because at the end of the day, I want our little girls, our black girls, to know who they are mm -hmm. and know that they're not these people that they're trying to make them out to be mm -hmm. on TV. Right. You know what I'm saying? Because mm -hmm. that's that's huge to me. Right. You know what I'm saying? Because you know they they are young ladies. Women have so much power. You know, we as a people will never be healed unless they are healed, mm -hmm. because we come through and from them. Right. So if they're sick, then what does that say for? <sighs> it's a rough road. Yeah. So. That's the type of stuff I've been working on lately. So okay. I'll send you some pics so you can show everybody right. what it is. Are you right. gonna do a show for it? Or um, what do you think about the rollout? You know, I had been talking to another artist that you've interviewed. I don't know if I should call him out, but um, we had talked about doing a show for it. Okay. But um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you need some help with that? Let me know. Okay. Yeah, I'm saying that. So um, we. Well, yeah. You know, and this is um, artists we love, man, and this is more resettings. And once again, man, thank you for taking time with us. Yeah, you man. know what I mean, and letting the world into some of your thought process. Yeah, thank you for for having me, man. Appreciate yeah. it. We here, you know yeah. what I mean. So this is YBE TV. My name is Okiba Jabalo, and once again, this is more resettings, and we'll make sure we have all his links so you can go directly to him out in the digital space and get to it and buy something at full price, not half <laughs> price, no discounts, no hookups, none of that. Full price. Alright, so this is artists we love and thank you.